So first of all, we'll have Lawrence Hill. So Lawrence is an independent curator and creative producer, working primarily with digital artists. He's also a visiting research fellow at the Sussex Humanities Lab and a lecturer on the digital media art MA at the University of Brighton. Lawrence's curatorial practice is focused on working with LGBTQ+, BAME, neurodiverse and disabled artists to explore representation and embodiment in digital spaces and the ways in which artists can and should be helping to create those spaces. Uh, next, we will have Dr. Sarah Perry and Cecilia Lavrato on the panel, both from the Museum of London Archaeology. And Cecilia is an archivist with a background in medieval archaeology, history and museums. Her main interests are in museum collections and archives as repositories of knowledge, sources of inspiration and creativity, and how they exist as social tools in the present. Sarah is Director of Research and Engagement there, and she's led a number of research projects, including the Emotive Consortium, focusing on the research design, development and evaluation methods that can support the cultural and creative industries in creating narratives. She's also worked on international capacity building projects around recording conservation, interpretation and education about the built heritage in the Global South. And finally, we have uh, Dr. Katie Eagleton, Director of Libraries and Museums at St. Andrews University. Um, Katie's career has combined library, archival and museum collections. And after completing her PhD at Cambridge, she became the curator at the British Museum, then the British Library's Head of Asian and African Collections, and then Associate Director of Curatorial Affairs at the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History. Um, Katie's also a member of the AHRC Steering Group towards a national collection aiming to open digital access to cultural heritage collections. So welcome to all of our speakers um, today and I'm going to hand over to Lawrence. Thank you Lawrence. Thank you Suzanne. Okay I'm just going to share my screen. Right hopefully everyone can see that. <clears throat> Um, I first wanted to say thank you to Suzanne for inviting me to take part in this panel. Um, I feel honoured to be among people producing such great work and thinking. Um, and thank you out there for coming along. I can't see you, sadly, but I hope one day we can do this all again in person. Um, this morning I'm going to talk about a project called Voice Over Brighton that I commissioned in 2018 when I was director of Brighton Digital Festival. This was, in essence, about the creation of an archive, or at least a possible archive. So as you'll see, I'm coming at this from a slightly different angle, but I think this project illustrated good practice in working with communities that are not our own. Um, Suzanne did a great introduction for me, so I'm gonna <coughs> skip most of what I'd written. Um, but I did want to just talk a little bit about the ethos that's behind my work. Um, I'm interested in work that uses di digital technology to offer a critique of digital technology and our increasingly digitally mediated world. And within that, I tried to steer a course between unthinking techno-evangelism and declinist technophobia. In my work, I'm driven by the concepts of critical optimism. I spend a lot of time thinking about how different people navigate online spaces and technologies, the development of which centers cisgender straight white men, thereby echoing the offline world. So I'm interested at least in part in work where the technology is used or subverted to tell a different story. When I was thinking about commissions for Bryan Digital Festival in 2018, and was thinking specifically about participative projects, I recalled seeing Usman Hack, the founder of Umbrellium, speaking at an event and being impressed by the careful thought he expressed when talking about Umbrellium's development of large scale participative projects, which always seemed to center the participants. Based in London, or at least they were in the before times, Umbrellium described themselves as, quote, a design and build studio dedicated to transforming urban environments and getting communities meaningfully involved. Once we agreed on working together, we spent a lot of time thinking about projects and finally decided on an iteration of something they'd done before called voiceover. 
this image features the technology which was central to the voiceover project. It's the box that you can see just behind the man in this image. Voiceover was the platonic ideal of digital projects. The tech was relatively complex, but its application was very simple. And the outcomes of that application could be incredibly rich. In essence, participants would agree to have one of the boxes that you saw in the previous slide in their home for a period of time. The box worked both as a radio in that content could be broadcast to it and as a recorder so that participants could record to it and those recordings could be saved to a central server. That was the basic premise and beyond that what happened exactly would be down to the individual instance in which the tech was used. There had been two previous iterations of voiceover, one on a street in East Durham and one in a tower block in Finsbury Park, which is the one you can see in this image. Another element of voiceover is the V-shaped lights that you'll notice in two of the windows. These lit up as the boxes were being broadcast to or were being recorded on. And this element is something that I'll come back to in relation to the specific community we worked with for voiceover Brighton. Both of these previous iterations had engaged geographically located communities. And when I came to think about how we might use it for the digital festival here, I found myself less interested in the idea of engaging participants in a particular geographical location and more interested in the idea of a dispersed community. And I went very quickly to the idea of working with trans people in the city. In terms of Brighton, in terms of numbers, there is significant trans community in Brighton, but they're dispersed and remain vulnerable in many ways. From the outset of the commission with Umbrellium, I had intended to lead to this project, especially it was the big spend of that year's festival. And until the moment I decided that we should work with the trans community, that had remained the case. But I'm not trans, and therefore I was fully not the right person to lead it. Which brings me to the brilliant Emma Franklin. Emma is a performer, a writer, an artist and an activist. Through a mutual friend, I made contact with her. She uses she, her pronouns. We met and agreed she would lead on the VoiceOver Brighton project. Part of our far reaching conversation on that day touched on the dangers of these kinds of participative projects, especially with marginalized communities. Dangers that I wanted to ensure were avoided. I wanted to lay out how, what those dangers are. And then as I discuss the project further, I hope it will be clear how they were resolved. In my time as a commissioner and programmer of work, particularly for Brighton Digital Festival, where we pushed to encourage work that engaged a wide range of the city's communities, there were a number of red flags that would make me want to question projects that were pitched to me or that I came across in my travels. The first one is the idea that by working with a marginalised community that you are giving them a voice. I trust I don't need to explain how problematic that is. This kind of top-down patronising attitude is thankfully less prevalent than it once was, but I came across an example just the other day, so it's still out there. Parachuting in is another issue. This happens when an organisation has decided that it wants to work with a marginalised community that it has no relationship to and no part of. So they jump in, deliver a project, and then walk away with no thought given to the longer term or delivering meaning to the participants. It's a box ticked and time to move on to the next group. The next red flag involves a lack of reciprocity. It is very common that an organisation has decided they want to work with a particular group and they're very excited about being able to gather the experience, the stories, the histories of that group, and then usually plan to repackage them often in some deracinated way, for example, as a VR experience. My question is always, so this group of people that you're essentially mining for content, what do they get out of it? What is the value to them? Last of these general concerns is a question of power and control. Where does the power, the decision-making lay in your project? If none of it lays with the community you want to work with, then that's a big problem. Emma had much the same concerns on those general red flags and she added some that were specific to the trans community. Against increasing hostility, trans people are continually being asked to explain and defend their existence to cisgender people, to lawmakers, to the media, all of whom are invested in making this a debate where none exists and continuing to stoke an environment antithetical to trans people. Emma was keen 
that as she approached potential particip participants, it'd be clear that we weren't asking them to justify their existence or using their existence, their experience, their stories as education and or entertainment. You might remember the element of the voiceover project that had lights in participants' windows. That aspect of it was a complete no from Emma. With visibility comes vulnerability, and for an already precarious community, even in a city famed for its tolerance, something that would identify the home of a trans person was a no-go. So here you can see during the active part of the project, the boxes in some people's houses. So the question of the lights was resolved uh, in a different way for Voice Over Brighton. Um, you can see in this image, Umbrellium created an interactive banner and it was situated at Marlborough, aka the Marley, a queer pub in the city and a hub for the trans community. The banner would light up as an individual recording was made and over the period of the project it came to be fully lit. Sadly, as far as I know, the Marley, where I've spent many a happy time, has yet to reopen after the closing of the last lockdown. The fragility of queer spaces is real. Having engaged Emma to lead the VoiceOver Brighton project, and after facilitating a meeting between her and Umbrellium, whose role from this point was to support the tech requirements of the project, I had no further engagement beyond some questions of logistics relating to the project's role as part of the festival of that year. Although I was clear I was there to support and if and as necessary, I had no role in choosing participants, no role in how the project was run, no role in deciding what the final outcome would be, other than stating at our first meeting that there had to be some kind of public outcome as required by our funding. So Emma took it from there and over four weeks in the summer of 2018, she posed a series of provo provocations to the participants and their answers were recorded. In the end, there were hundreds of individual recordings. And as a way of thanking them for their participation, each week she commissioned a trans performer to create a new work that would be broadcast solely to the project's participants via the boxes in their homes. Crucially, the participants were invited to identify on making each of their recordings, whether they wanted their words to be made available to a general audience or whether they wanted them to be heard only by other trans people. At the end of the active phase of the project, Emma and her collaborator Juan Carlos Otero made two sound landscapes, one for a general audience and one that was only available on request and only to trans people. You can see here the exhibition a gallery space in Brighton where the public soundscape was played back through the boxes that was originally used that were originally used to record them. In summary, I think that we took the concerns that both Emma and I had about these kinds of participative projects, especially with marginalised communities and crafted something that avoided those pitfalls had meaning and value to the participants and ultimately was something to be proud of. My contribution to that was mostly getting over my desire to control everything and getting the hell out of the way. It was a much better and more successful project because of it. So in the spirit of getting out of the way, I'm going to give the last word to Emma. We're artists, right? We're digital innovators. We are thinkers in this room. And it is our job to be challenging the status quo. We should be working with communities that are not our own. We should be expanding the conversation and the access to these technologies, but we should be interrogating how we are including those voices and bringing people into the room as leaders and giving them power. Oh, it's nice to see that uh, Sharon, who couldn't be with us today, does actually appear to, on today's session. That's her with Emma and me uh, on the stage at the conference that I organised. And that's me, I'm done. Thank you very much for listening. And those are the ways you can contact me if you would like to. Thanks ever so much, Lawrence. That's great. And yeah, as you said, it's lovely to see um, Sharon just making a little appearance at the end there. Um, thank you. We will um, we'll hold off on questions until we've had our speakers. So I'm going to hand over now to Sarah and uh, Cecilia to share with us. Thank you. Hi, all. Hello. I'm just <laughs> going to share the slides and then we'll kick it off.
hopefully that's all visible to you now. Um, thank you so much uh, for welcoming us today to this uh, round table. Uh, my name is Sarah Perry. I am, as you heard, uh, Director of Research and Engagement at MOLA, Museum of London Archaeology, and I'm here with my fantastic colleague, Senior Archivist Cecilia Liberato. Uh, MOLA is an educational charity that offers archaeological excavation services around the UK to more than 400 archaeology projects per year. Cecilia and I are part of the research and engagement team comprising nearly 90 people who take the data artifacts and other records from these 400 plus excavations and interpret, synthesize, archive and engage specialists and wider public audiences with them. I oversee the RE. Uh, team, research and engagement team, and Cecilia is based in MOLA's London office, primarily working with the London Archaeological Archive, the largest archaeological archive in the UK. It's been in the Guinness Book of World Records and um, containing resources from 8,500 archaeological sites investigated in Greater London over the past 100 years. Given the brevity of this presentation, what we're going to do is have me briefly introduce the incredible potentials of the archaeological record, as well as the possibilities and challenges of more radical or critical forms of archival practice for better activating these potentials of archaeology. Cecilia will then introduce you to the very, cons the very constrained workflows and requirements that archaeologists at MOLA and stakeholders involved in archiving archaeological finds and records in general are bound by, and she will put forward some propositions for a means to begin to unbind ourselves from these constraints. We will then leave you with a few um, questions that you, we might want to consider during the discussion period. Many people have suggested that an empirical research confirms that archaeology is a wondrous subject matter. It has inherent in it sources of human enchantment following Jane Bennett's conceptualization of enchantment. So all of us here today, uh, indeed everyone everywhere at all points in time are literally atop untold histories that we have never seen before, that we may know nothing of, and that can surprise and transform us in innumerable ways. The very nature of archaeology as a subject that's open to interpretation as new techniques, new voices, new intellectual frameworks and new discoveries themselves are introduced furthers this facility for archaeology's ability to surprise and transform. The archaeological archive then is exceptional because archaeologists are in fact assigning meaning at the earliest possible stages to materials that may never before have been encountered by present day humans. In other words, it is commonplace for archaeologists to be the origin point for meaning uh, of objects and sites. And this meaning is then embedded into all subsequent products of the archaeological process, from our primary recording forms to secondary archival descriptions to the circulation of historical information in video games, on YouTube, in books, in schools, and everywhere else that you might encounter it. The archive and its requirements therefore crystallize all of this meaning. And with this point about crystallization in mind, we do need to be incredibly concerned by the overwhelming abundance of research that demonstrates that archives, including their local data, their shared vocabularies, ontologies and conceptual models, plus the digital and physical infrastructures that house them are born of colonialism. They are complicit per Hughes Watkins in continuing to uphold oppressive and unequal systems. Realmeyer calls them uh, assemblages of politicized decisions. Drake in his Keystone lecture on liberatory archives notes just how obvious are the entrenched biases. Indeed, the injustices embedded in some archives have led them to be deem deemed weapons of affect. The irony here is that we're probably not lost on any of us, that, the, that it is precisely through the seemingly universal effort to strip archives of AFACT, to standardize, depersonalize, and singularize them, that they have become such weapons. Krimpetich and Somerville liken the process to the creation of, quote, non-interpretative tombstone labels. And by Drake's reckoning, quote, the traditional ways that archives do business are in many ways antithetical to the notion of a community. 
where more promising approaches that we've been inspired by have been piloted to tackle systemic bias, social inequity and racial injustice in data repositories, there does seem to be a link to regional and national level policy change. In other words, it's larger social pressures and legal obligations that are mandating advancements in archival practice in different sectors. For an example might be through Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Commission, where a push for a quote, quote, more ethical, hospitable, responsive, empathic archive has been launched. But what is notable is that these policy changes and related commissions have yet to have any real impact on archeological archiving. More local or non-policy focused efforts to rectify biases, including archival redescription, revised ethical metadata standards, felt experience conceptual model extensions, for example, the CIDOC CRM, and alternative fluid, fluid ontologies, which are things that we've been exploring. And we've been particularly inspired by the British Museum's research space and IVAO's uh, Indigenous Knowledge Graph. So the imperative for change, I think, is overt, yet recognition that this change must begin from the moment that the data are conceived, as opposed to the moment they are deposited into a repository has been slow in coming. And furthering our argument is the rapid pace of innovation with data acquisition technologies, whose workflows still fail to capture important descriptive detail, emotion, human values, and multiple viewpoints. And archeologists are readily taking on board these data acquisition technologies for a lot of different um, archeological work. Even as community-driven practices grow in popularity, fundamental redesign of our workflows and data to embed communities and justice at their core is still lacking. Design justice frameworks, um, for instance, the work of uh, uh, Sasha Costanza Chalk, are enabling this kind of value-led, co-created redesign of digital and other infrastructures, but their systemic use in fields like archaeology is effectively non-existent. So what can we do? How do we proceed? I'm going to pass it over here now to Cecilia. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, so firstly, I'd like to make clear that um, what I'm going to talk about makes reference to the archive department and MOLA and that there are some community projects already happening in other parts of the organization, mainly in Citizen and the Thames Discovery Program, which are doing great work with communities. But I think that as an organization, we could and should be doing more to involve communities in the archaeological process and in the creation of archaeological knowledge and archives. What makes me want to be involved in this conversation and work with Sarah is the realization that the archiving process at MOLA is quite linear and that as it is at the moment, it doesn't allow participation for, for, from communities in a creative and more radical way. In fact, I believe it doesn't allow participation in a creative interventionist way from people inside the organization itself apart from, to a certain extent, the specialists in pottery, metal, animal bone, etc. The structure is such that it removes opportunities for being creative and thinking in multidirectional fluid ways within and about the archaeology. This is not the case only with MOLA, but I think something of a trait of commercial archaeology in general. When a project arrives at the archive department to be prepared and curated for the position in a museum, it is considered to be finished. Everything that was supposed to be done with the archaeology has been done, and the task of the archivist is to physically prepare, prepare it for the position, following guidance produced by the museum or other local repositories. The input of the archivist is very limited, and their ability to add to or change the archive in a meaningful way is very small. As I have said, the archivist prepares both the record and finds archives, checking completeness, cross-referencing, labels, appropriate boxing, etc., and produces plans and a digital archive. The main area of creation for the archivist is within the digital, but here too, it is very rigid and linear and often amounts to adding a few annotations. As again, we follow guidelines that weren't conceived by the archivists themselves. Thus, as you see, this process allows very little input from the archivist and therefore even less input from communities. The challenge is 
how do we get communities to participate in the creation of the archaeological archive when not even the archivists themselves can have a meaningful impact? I've thought of possibilities, but the following are only sketches. I think this round table is a good place to share these ideas and see your responses, to get advice from you and from people listening about your experiences and better ways to include communities in our work. I believe that one of the paradigms, presuppositions that needs to change in order, in order to encourage greater community participation in the archives is the idea that when the archive arrives at the archive department, it is already closed. We need to change this negative, uh, this negative paradigm for a more positive one, one of opportunities, one which sees the archive as very much alive during the whole process, right up to a deposition in a museum and farther still. This was a, will allow us to see the archive as something that can be changed, worked with, created, alive at all stages. A first step towards such a change could be to make the process less linear. This would involve engaging the archive department earlier on during the creation of the archives themselves, enabling meaningful conversations between teams and as a consequence, opening up space for archivists and communities to intervene in significant ways. Such a shift would, I think, produce at least two ways in which communities could be a part of the development and further creation of an archaeological archive. One involves the addition of affective experiences to the archaeological archives. Often, what is found in excavations, evaluations, and watching briefs lacks evidence of past people's feelings, thoughts, emotions. Furthermore, the rigid nature and linearity of the archaeological process in a commercial organization makes it hard for archaeologists themselves to have a more holistic relationship with archaeology, one which is flexible enough to accommodate the possibility of more abstract and subjective interpretations. That is, one which is freed from purely instrumental descriptions to engage with more inquisitive and curious lines of inquiry. Because these affective response experiences, sorry, do have a value, and a value not only for future research. As we allow communities to forge a relationship with archaeology, perhaps local to them, and allow that relationship to go in different di directions decided by and managed by the communities themselves, they perform and create a sense of belonging, of the right to have a more meaningful connection with their own history. The communities would perform the right to interpret archaeology, certain that these interpretations would also have great value in informing future work with the archive. Following from a similar preoccupation with what is lacking in the archaeological archives is the involvement in the creation of communities who tend not to be represented by them. That is, adding the voices of those silenced by historical processes, which are in part responsible for the archaeology we dig up today. Most archaeological archives attest to a heterosexual, male-dominated, Christian adult world. And a way for the archaeological profession to reckon with its exclusion of proscribed minority voices in the past would be to provide a space in the present for those who represent those communities today. I am referring, for example, to communities of women, LGBT+, ethnic minorities, religions other than Christian, children, and Gypsy and traveler communities. Furthermore, these communities tend not to be represented in the archaeological profession itself, which is not very diverse, meaning that there is a shaming lack of multiplicity of voices interpreting archaeology. As with the previous suge suggestion, for the archives to truly become a space of emancipation and inclusiveness, the communities themselves should be empowered to decide the shape the relationship with the archaeology will take and the kind of responses they will want to record and share. As commercial archaeology institutions like MOLA have tight schedules for delivering work to our clients, I believe the archive preparation stage, with its slower pace and less tight deadlines, to be the most suitable for allowing the aforementioned communities the space to work with the archaeology to create a more holistic, radical, and creative archive. With time, this would hopefully feed back to the whole archaeological process, transforming it into a less linear, static one one that would have added hearts in collaboration with multiple communities, which would inform our relationship with the archaeology itself. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cecilia and Sarah. That was that was really interesting. Thank you. Um, made me realise how ignorant I am about archaeology. So I've learned a lot from, from from just those few minutes. So thanks very much, both of you. Um, right, I'm going to hand straight over now to Katie. Thank you. I'm just going to share some slides with everybody. But thank you for inviting me to be part of this session. It's um, hang on. Sorry, I will get the slide started and then stop talking. There we go. Really delighted to be part of this session. I'm going to talk about a couple of different projects and a different kind of partnership, but then think about how that relates to the communities that museums and archives serve. So I'm going to start by talking about the University Museums in Scotland network. And this is nine universities with collections that are members. And it's the universities that have accredited museum collections in Scotland. But what's quite interesting about these universities is in many of them, although not all of them, the archive and museum collections are part of a converged service. So it's, it's a really interesting uh, and quite um, permeable definition of museum here. It includes quite a lot of different kinds of material. Five of the members of UMIS, the University Museums in Scotland group, have recognised collections. These are collections of national and international importance. And we sometimes think of ourselves as having a sort of distributed national collection. I'll say a bit more about that in a moment. But this is who we're talking about. So the, the list of the nine is here. And you can see the range of types of institution from the Glasgow School of Art to Universities of Edinburgh and Glasgow through to all sorts of other institutions, including the University of St Andrews, where I am. And I mentioned this point about the collection. Between us, we look after 1.8 million objects. And this is just the museum objects. I'm sort of leaving photographs and archives out for a moment here. And that's 32% of Scotland's science history, 31% of its coins and medals, 24% of its fine art, 20% of its natural science, and 18% of its world culture. So in a very real way, this, this network of museums working together holds a collection that is, is very big and very important across Scotland, but it holds it from within universities. And that gives us an interesting relationship to the communities in Scotland and beyond and to the museum sector in Scotland and beyond. Um, a couple of really practical points. We benefit from having a shared coordinator post. This is her in the, uh, in the circle in the middle. She's called Sarah Berry Hayes. And that really helps us be a tight network and supports projects and advocacy. And we're also lucky enough to have funding from the Scottish Funding Council, which acknowledges the way that these collections and these museums make a much bigger contribution than just to the, the specific universities that hold them. Now, there's also huge differences between this group. There are wide variation in the number of staff, wide variation in the size and scope of the collections, wide, wide variation in the kind of position and remit within the universities for this group. And what we really try and do is work together to, to support each other and to draw strength from the differences as well as the similarities within our network. There's also big differences in terms of whether there's a dedicated venue or not in how much funding within the organization and from grant funding there is and in the different levels of activity. So we're, we're a really interesting kind of microcosm of lots of different kinds of organization while still being within the university sector. And we work together in quite a lot of ways. Like I said, we've been developing much closer working, much more tight and active advocacy, a joint strategy, joint annual report, all of that kind of thing. But that's not what I'm here to talk to you about today. What I'm here to talk to you about today is a couple of projects we've done recently, which draw strength from this network to deliver in two different ways to two different communities that we are here for. And, you know, we won't dwell on this, but this is all really starting to think about how we've had to adapt in relation to COVID and its impact. Because just like everybody else, everything changed when we all went into lockdown. Everything about the way we normally work with our overlapping and different communities and everything about the way we work with our collections changed. The core business for universities of teaching and learning changed, our venues closed, our collections ended up very much restricted access and in some places closed completely. So what we did at that point is to work even more closely together. We decided that there was a real risk in a crisis situation of universities ending up being in competition with each other and in, in ways that we thought weren't helpful. 
And actually collaboration and mutual support were the best thing we could do as a partnership. And if you think of this as a kind of sector community, we met more frequently. We worked much more actively together on joint projects. And there's two examples that I'll just mention very briefly to bring out here, because I think they work with different kinds of communities and they have different kinds of relationship to the collections and those communities. But they, they bring out this theme of what a network and a group of organizations can do together that probably none of us could have done on our own. The first is a project called Capturing Lives, which brought young people from across Scotland into a project to explore and document their lives in their communities. 64% um, of participants in, in this project had never really engaged with the university before. And we, we knew we wanted to target um, school students in areas that were what we call widening participation backgrounds. So that's areas of economic deprivation, areas from which students are less likely to aspire to or go to university. So we had some multiple aims for this project. One was a sort of project that was about using creativity to explore life. And this was summer 2020. So life and the impact of COVID and the restrictions on that, on the lives of these, um, uh, these students, but also to pair the school students with university student mentors to start to create relationships and mutual understanding between those two groups. And the participants created work, which we then featured digitally. So we never brought this into our permanent collection, but we featured it. We connected it to the art collections held across all the partners in the University Museums in Scotland group. And it was something that we were really proud of because of the layers of, of ways that this connected to our communities and to our collections. I'm really delighted sort of breaking news as of this week is that we were highly commended in the volunteering award at the Museums and Heritage Awards because of the role of the student mentors. So a project that really, I think many of us have done these kinds of projects where you, you do an art project with a community group. We obviously made sure there was an arts award attached to it. So the participants got a real kind of qualification and a credential that they could use for whatever they want to do next. But we found one of the greatest benefits from this project was this, this partnership, this mentoring and volunteering and the connection between university and school students. So there's a link there to a blog about the project if you're interested in finding out more, but it's, it's an example of how I think the impact of COVID made us rethink a kind of fairly classic form of project and do something that's much stronger and much deeper and richer than we could have done before. And then the second example, a very different kind of community here, because obviously universities work with communities in the way that the Capturing Lives project does, but also our community, our internal community, and the way we support research and teaching and learning is a hugely important thing for university collections. And that was just as disrupted by COVID as anything else, but that gave us an opportunity to really think about how we open up collections to the communities for whom we hold them, including our own staff and students, but also beyond that. So we're doing a project at the moment, which is researching that question about how we support teaching and learning with digital and digitized collections. And that's making us question all kinds of assumptions we might previously have made about what we should do and where we should invest and what we've done as adaptations to a crisis that should actually become permanent changes to the way we work. So that's very much work in progress at the moment. There's a link there to a microsite about the project. And we're doing a survey at the moment, which is capturing information across anybody who's in a higher education context, who's been teaching online with digitized collections in the last year. So I won't say too much more about that because there's been other sessions at this conference about it, but it's another way of thinking about how, how we make these collections active and relevant and useful to the communities that we hold them for. So I will stop there now so that we have plenty of time for what I'm sure will be a really interesting discussion and look forward to it. Thanks very much, Katie. That's great, really um, interesting stuff. And as you say, I think there'll be um, lo lo lots of questions um, for more detail on some of your, your projects that you've talked about. I'm going to ask the other panelists to sort of come back in and switch their cameras on so we can see everybody again. Hello, everyone. Great, thank you. 
So just um, just a reminder then, if, um, if 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 anybody would like to ask a question, it would be great if you'd like to ask it in person. Just put your your hand up, and um, we'll we'll pull you in. If you'd prefer to just put it in the chat, that's fine. We can pick them up from the chat. We've had some questions in already, so if we'll do those in order. So perhaps could we first of all bring in Maria? Might take just a moment to make that happen. Okay, I think she's just about to join us. Uh, we might have lost her. Well, <laughs> we might have to come back to um, Marie. I think we've just got a technical hitch um, bringing her in. So maybe if we'll start with um, another question that came in, which um, was about, um, oh, no, sorry, I spoke too soon. Maria has joined us. So let's, let's do Maria first. Thank you, uh, Maria. If you want to unmute yourself and then we can hand over to you to ask your question. Hi, hi, thank you. Yeah, I, um, I kind of lost you for a minute or two there. So right. if, I, if I've missed an important point, uh, forgive me. Uh, no, I was, uh, I was interested, but all of the all of the presentations were really interesting. Thank you very much. They were great. Um, took a lot from from all of those. Um, interested in Lawrence's work around, you know, how you engage uh, with marginalised communities. I'm, I'm from uh, Dorset's archive we're kind of tailing off an LGBTQ plus project and I'm working very closely with our GRT community at the moment on on shaping a bid uh, with them um, so I think Lawrence really highlighted a lot of a lot of pitfalls that can lie along that way um, in terms of where power sits in terms of who 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 is able to instigate projects you know we're often able to instigate things from within our institutions because we understand how to apply for a bit of funding or what have you um, and then start start doing the the outreach um, so yeah it's it's really hard and I, I loved all your points and I just underlined all those to myself you know that reciprocal kind of element that really needs to be there and, and designing that in which other people touched on as well I, I just was interested to know Lawrence what what happened to to the recordings were you able to place them with an archive at all um not yet I mean I think I should be clear that I mean that, that it, it was conceived as an arts project yes I think the archive came you know out of that um, so we didn't have conversations at the time. The, uh, the, the recordings sit with Emma uh -huh. as the leader of the project. Um, in fact, I just got in touch with her last week because I knew I was doing this just to see uh, what her intentions were. And she, I know that she wants to use them to do something with them. Um, so the participants um, gave the copyright to Emma? Yes. Right, right. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so yeah, watch the space really. Nothing's yeah. happened with them at the moment. I think yeah. you know, we did this in 2018. So sometimes it's, I think it can be quite useful to sit on things a little bit and see what the best value for those recordings would be in the long run. I, yeah. I, I have no doubt that you know, something will be done with them if they're not going to archive that they might be repurposed into some kind of online space where they can be made available. Yeah. So I guess that is a kind of um, <clears throat> a bit of a dilemma for us where we where we cross into arts projects as well, because um, I would sort of take a view that if people have contributed uh, such personal material, we would want to um, discuss with them from the start what, what might be the possible uses of that and to ensure that material isn't recorded and then lost to the historical record, really, um, you know, and ends up a kind of siloed somewhere. So. Um, yeah, I, I would really be interested to hear if other people have, have thoughts on that as well. Thank you. Thanks very much, Maria. I don't know, um, Katie, Cecilia or Sarah, do any of you want to come in on that on that point? And, and obviously Lawrence again as well, if there's anything else you well, want to I, I think I would just say that those kind of ethical questions about what happens to the 
materials that people have recorded are really key. And I think it's 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 really worth trying to, as you're setting up the project, kind of future proof it in essence. Um, mm. There was a, a a kind of major oral archive that was collected here in Brighton. It's, it's called Queer in Brighton Archive. I know it well, yeah. It's I very, do. Okay, yeah. Cool. So um, it was one of our reference points for our, our project down here. It was one of the things we sort of looked at and wondered what we wanted to do the same or differently or what have you. So nice. Yeah. So one well, so one of the things I, I think that Sharon may have talked about this if she'd been here is I worked with her a few years ago on kind of looking at that archive, which was essentially sitting on a memory stick under someone's bed in the book, mm. and um, you know how we might reanimate some of it at least. Mm. And mm. some of the, and, and we did that through, we, we ran an open call for an artist who, who used some of the material then to create an installation. But um, one of the problems that, with that is that when they collected that information, they didn't necessarily, <clears throat> and it, it was a while ago. So if we wanted to use it again for another purpose, it became a process whereby we had to go back and find those people and say, is it all right if we use it for this purpose, which is not what you originally agreed? Yeah, that, that can be really tricky. I mean, we've got, uh, I guess everybody, every county's probably got the same problem in essence that all around museums and archives across Dorset, we know there are things sitting, as you say, on memory sticks, tapes, beta max kind of, <laughs> you know. But, but if those materials are from marginalized communities, then I think it's especially important that we try to gather those materials up because in effect, the same communities are being asked again and again to give their impressions, to give their voices, to give their memories, to give their feelings. And if we don't kind of take care of those and bring them together, then there will become fatigue in the community and we will have missed, you know, stages of the story, uh, including the story of their involvement with institutions such as our own. Uh, part of that will be lost. Mm. So I did just speak to Dorset Museums Association yesterday and, and put forward the idea that we should jointly fund, which was another really interesting thing from Katie, you know, the power of, of coming together, whether we should look at a kind of a, a joint funding of a project to find all those materials, bring them into DHC where we are used to risk assessing those packages and managing them in a restricted manner for a long time if that's what's necessary to preserve them. So working with a local archive like the Keep might help with that risk assessment process yeah, sure thanks very much um, Katie do you want to come in on that yeah really on that last point I think the interesting challenge for all of us is always when is it the right thing to bring material in and this is to, to Lawrence's point about the relationships of trust when when is something more like post custodial collecting where you support the community taking their own their own care of their own things the the better option and, and how to make sure things don't get lost or damaged or disappear without necessarily being always looking to bring everything in mm. because mm. that's that's not feasible but it's also sometimes not appropriate sometimes it's better to sort of empower and and help somebody take their own care of something that it's important to them to retain ownership of mm. and you know the, the temptation is so strong to say bring it bring it in we'll look after it but I don't always know the relationships of trust are there to make that feel comfortable for the communities we're working with. Thanks, oh, I totally, Katie. That's totally yeah. sorry. Just to come back in, I totally agree, Katie. And um, working with community collections and archives, yeah, I would see in a slightly different box to working with our local museum partners. So uh, yeah, I was I was restricting the thought of that post to to other you know specific archives and museums. I totally agree that material should often sit sit with the community. Mm. Thanks, thanks, Maria. Thanks for thanks for uh, being brave enough to join us and um, posing some really interesting questions. That that's great. So, thank you. I'm going to move on to the next question that's come in, which I think um, from somebody who can't join us on the screen, but they've asked their question: How would the archaeological archivist deal with computing histories for the same object? So, I'm guessing that's a question for Sarah and Cecilia. I think um, there's a couple of different parts to this, the answer to this question, because I think that a lot of time comp competing um, interpretations usually get um, encapsulated in the kind of synthetic work. So in, you know, the blog posts that are produced or the books or, you know, videos or whatnot. And that this is it, the, the ma major problem, which is that the archives themselves 
for the most part, are unable to, uh, to in incorporate those competing interpretations. And as you might imagine, all the time, um, virtually at every moment when you're doing excavation, you, you, are, you are navigating multiple different interpretations. So that's the kind of high level uh, uh, response that I think Cecilia might have some specific. Um, yeah, I was thinking that sometimes like you don't need to decide in which, like which interpretation to um, keep uh, like and which one to discuss. Sometimes that um, kind of uh, conversation between interpretations is what makes the archaeology rich and which makes it advanced. So yeah, so when there are two interpretations, um, just let them kind of um, exist both at the same time because um, like, um, yeah, like sometimes um, just trying to choose one uh, of, of, of them actually um, doesn't allow archaeology to um, to grow and to kind of incorporate new ideas. Um, so I don't think it's bad to have more than one interpretation at the same time. Um, yeah. You can get a sense from the workflow that um, Cecilia presented in the slides that there isn't a lot of space to do anything at all. Um, you know, we're bound by a series of requirements that are almost impossible to change without massive sectoral change. Um, and uh, the, the, the various initiatives that we have been inspired by, which links to one of the next questions in the chat, so I'm just going to pre <laughs> Um, preface that that the answers to that question, and um, you know where they where we've been inspired by communities that are working, for instance, with conceptual models like Sidoc and others to create the space to be able to deal incorporate felt experience. But we continue within archaeology to be bound by such strict um, guidelines where the archivists themselves can't can't even participate in that in the conversation. So you can get a sense that I, I think. I feel at least I don't want to speak for both of us or the entire profession, but but I will. Um, <laughs> um, the, that um, we are incredibly far behind and there's a huge amount of work um, to, to do. I mean, decades worth of work to get us to the position where you might genuinely be able to have multiple interpretations embedded in the archive itself. Yeah, I think that happens more maybe in universities that with commercial archaeologists, but I think it's important that commercial archaeology starts dealing with it because as more and more like archaeology departments in university are under threat of closure, I think the responsibility to have um, like a varied conversation of and discussions about what archaeology is and, 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 and different interpretations will, will be in the commercial um, archaeology profession more than in universities. So I think it's important that we engage with that. Thank you. I don't know, if, Katie and Lawrence, if you have anything you want to add to that. If, if not, I'll move on. But Yeah, I, I suppose what I'd add is, is I completely agree that, that, that we have challenges as a sector in that, every, I mean, the really basic stuff, our databases, our standards, the fact that we talk about terminology control, like this, this is all speaking to a view that there is a right way to do it and a right set of information. And I think we we know that there's often around objects a process of decontextualization as they move into a sort of controlled, managed collection. And we have work to do as a sector to work out how to make that much more, much more, much more open. And I'm, I like the concept that, that came out a few years ago of the generous interface, like letting people in to make their own meaning with our collections and finding room for that within the really, really basic stuff like our databases and our terminology and all that kind of thing. But we have, we're nowhere close to being able to make that a reality. And I think that's where the sector has to work together because it, it will need to push for very large change to make that a reality and to stop us perpetuating the same problems for the future around not all the information all being kind of captured in the right way as a kind of master and primary documentation rather than as I think it was Sarah or Cecilia said, the kind of interpretative overlays to make that core rather than add on, I think it's going to require a big change in our sector. Is that, is that, 
you're both talking about kind of massive sexual change. Is that conversation even starting to happen, or is it, or is it just happening in kind of individual? It is starting. It yeah. is starting, but the the scale of it is a bit daunting. I think there's some interesting proof of concept kind of technical solutions and workflows, and that sharing those I think will help. But it's it's a big challenge. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we've got another question that's come in. I don't know if the if Robin can join us, so I shall read out Robin's question. But if Robin, you appear, then that's fine. I'll just hand straight over. So the question is, how do you think we can resolve the tension between professional archives wanting to give autonomy to community groups collecting and telling their own stories and ensuring these collections and stories can be captured and shared in a way that fits in with archival um, standards. So that's probably a question for all of you, actually, isn't it? So who wants to go first? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how you resolve that tension. Um, I think you have to ask the question, you know, the community, the, 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 you know, whichever community you're working with has to be involved in, in, in answering that question. And I'm not sure that there is a blanket solution or a blanket answer for that um you know i have no expertise in, in in kind of kind of formal archiving so i can't speak to that side of it but um i think um yeah i think actually i just said what i think <laughs> so i don't think there's a blanket answer and, and but, but the you know the community you're working with has has to be involved in that conversation because they have to have they have to have the power to direct what happens and, and I also, can I say something? Um, the uh, like archival standards for archaeology are a bit different than like normal archival standards. But um, just also to have in mind that archival standards were created by humans. <laughs> and so they can also be changed. Um, and so maybe we shouldn't always try to be kind of thinking, oh, okay, we have to always kind of follow those guidelines that they are written in stone, we cannot, and, but also kind of have in mind that, okay, maybe we have to start thinking about, well, maybe we need to change those standards to allow maybe more flexibility. It's still kind of, yeah, having, not going crazy, but like having a, a, a kind of, um, uh, yeah, and a standard, but, but allow it to be a bit more fluid to allow exactly different communities, each with their own particularities to be able to work with the archives. Maybe there's uh, a way of having like more than one you know, yeah. set of archive <laughs> planners, maybe there should be a hundred or a thousand or whatever, so that there is, you know, a model that fits, you know, most uh, opportunities. I think there's also room potentially for us as a sector to get get better and clearer about explaining why I mean standards are standards but but where they're required because there's a good good reason we need to say why we need to sort of bring people into the the, the sort of mystery of, of this stuff because I think sometimes just asserting it has to be that way because of standards sounds a bit like putting up a wall whereas we could be much more open about saying here's here's how we think about this here's why we're worried about this and then start a conversation because it, it's always a balance, right? If, you know, I'm just thinking if you've got an object and it's so important, for example, that it's handled, you might take a controlled risk of damage to that object because the importance of it being active and used and, you know, valuable and, and you know, accessible, actually you balance that against the, the really sort of real risk of damage. And you make those decisions all the time as somebody managing a collection. You, you just cannot like put standards and shut the doors and, and stop, like hold back time essentially. So I think being more open about why we make those decisions and how those decisions are always balances of, of risk and opportunity and, and bring people into that conversation will help because it isn't an absolute, it's always a decision and a professionally thoughtfully done decision but it's, the standards don't ever tell you everything you need to do. Thank you, um, everyone. We've got, um, we've got a few more questions that have come in. Um, Eleanor, do you want to um, 
unmic yourself and ask yours next. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for the speakers and uh, it's really, really good conversation that we're having here and linked to what Cecilia um, and Sarah were talking before. I was just wondering, um, so I just, uh, just linking back to the archaeology, um, there's been for the past 10 years conversation through the archaeology world or how to um, make accessible through visualization um, multiple interpretation of the same um, data. And still after 10 years, we're probably just being close to see something that might actually work from a student user perspectives. And I was just wondering if we, of course, we are quite behind in terms of library and museums um, in that conversation. But I'm just wondering if there is a space of the interest or if something like um, archaeology had done with the London Charter where um, there was a group of researchers from different institutions across the world that got together and I'm just mentioning it for people that are not familiar with the London and civil charters where they're trying to actually set the standards to get together to define what they were, um, how they were using the tools, the technological tools um, into, to allow those interpretation and visualization um, mainly to cover um, um, transparency, intellectual transparency, but also from the researcher's perspective point of view, setting some of the standards, starting those conversations that then led 10 years down the line to be in a situation where we just seen some um, of those kind of results or outcomes popping up. And I'm just wondering if maybe we're at the stage, even with this panel, to start to have a serious conversation and sitting down at the table if we might actually need something similar where we're all committing to maybe do a small step in the same direction. And again, explain a little bit better as Katie says, um, why do we need those um, standards? Which is again, it could be basic naming, it could be metadata to have it more discoverable, but also talking about sustainability, um, how we're gonna keep those files available. Why are we suggesting them maybe library or not libraries or community might actually have a system um, that protect them and preserve actually all the work that they've done. So I'm just wondering if this is something that the sector might be interested in working on exploring this as an opportunity. The, when, when I saw your question come up, I was thinking we're I'm lucky enough to be working on one of the uh, towards national collection emergency um, projects where the foot where we're to cut a long story short, looking at um, small museums as use and um, work. Uh, uh, competency, I guess, with the uh, fair principles, so findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable. And I, my instinct around this is that those, the fair principles, the, the care principles, um, and the trust, uh, overall kind of trust approach to data repositories provide a bit of that um, foundation. I think the early findings from the work with the um, uh, tank emergency project is that um, it, you know, people are working from such a base level that the principles, and I don't mean that in a disparaging way at all, I mean people are just trying to get by, especially right now, um, and the, those principles will become, I think, more and more uh, uh, important and offer a bit of that baseline that you're talking about. Uh, going going forward and certainly in complement with care and trust and um, I think I, I would say the other part of this is that I do think that there is uh, and Katie mentioned it as well that there are a significant number of pilot studies that demonstrate we can actually um, evolve the standards as Cecilia was saying and um, that they work well or, or, or on the course to working well I mean the towards the national collection and um, discovery projects are uh, that I'm familiar with, I think, are on course to demonstrating some of this potential for um, change. And the work that has been done, like the Yale University Libraries has been doing some incredible work, the British Museum's uh, work. There's so many inspiring examples of how, how we've already got the foundations there. And so it goes back to that bigger point, I think, that you're and everyone is making about drawing people more concertedly into the conversation um, and evolving it. Um, perhaps slightly faster, um, because some of the work that was done in the 2000s by uh, Srini Bassan and colleagues, where they were building the kind of foundations for fluid ontologies, I don't, you know, we're still kind of working from the basics of that right now, but it's 20 years at uh, 20 years on, so. Sorry, I just... <laughs> 
<laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I we have we've got somebody else has joined us. We've got we've got Jill. Good so, morning. If you can hear me, we can. Um, Thank you. Um, it was just about when we were talking about standards and I think most people look at standards as a way of making their material discoverable. And I think there's a push at the moment to make everything available to everybody. And perhaps some of the communities that we work with aren't so concerned about that at this stage. Um, maybe they just want their material captured. Maybe it was just the experience of being heard. And perhaps when we offer to work with a community, it's their priorities as to why they're wanting to join that will drive what standards we do or don't use. And we might be keen for everybody to have access to data. And I think that's really important that we open up and use as many voices as possible. But if some of those voices are not at the same stage, perhaps we need to think about how we can accommodate that. Thank you very much, um, Jill. Does anybody um, want to respond to Jill? I, mean, I, I think I just agree 100% with what you just said, Jill. I mean, it, is, it has to be down to the community, you know, and, and the, 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 the part of the voiceover project in Brighton was that there would be an aspect that would not be made available public, publicly. And uh, that felt like a really important thing to me. Um, you know, and often to certainly there was a few kind of eyebrows raised. I didn't really get any sort of serious pushback on it, but it was a bit like, well, this is public money, should be, you know. Um, and it was very easy to kind of to talk around that. But I think um, that that the question of, of you know, meeting the community's needs first and foremost is the most important thing, as far as I'm concerned. I think there might be an option to explain why their contribution is so important and to ask, would we be able to keep it for 70 years, 100 years, whatever it might be, because it's a point of valuing their voice, but as at the same time as giving them control over what happens to the material. We shouldn't be giving control. Giving's the wrong word. Um, helping them to manage control of their data, perhaps because we have some capacity for that um, and to explain that it's important what they have to say and would they mind if we kept it and didn't share it until a hundred years or whatever later but to have those conversations is about what they feel they were achieving with working with us and it isn't about us capturing their data is it You're muted, Suzanne. Thank you. Um, does anybody else like to respond? I just said that, that what you missed was me saying thank you, Jill. <laughs> um, um, any, any other responses to Jill? If not, I can move on to the next question. I suppose, sorry, can I, just add one? can I just add one thing? I just think also that people's, that there has to be some kind of fluidity within this because people's feelings about what they've said also changes over time. And I think that's one of the, the the issues that they had with the Queer in Brighton Oral Archive and, you know, when we kind of revisiting it in order to kind of maybe think about using it in a different way that people would said, you know, had said things at the time that they were happy for happy to be shared, but had since changed their minds and weren't happy for that stuff to be shared. So I think we just have to remember that the, an archive, an oral archive or any kind of archive is actually a living thing, if, as you know, as long as the people that contributed to it are still around, then, you know, it's not set in stone. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, Jill, for um, joining us on the panel for that. We've got Ruth now on the panel. So Ruth, do you want to unmute and um, give, us, give us your question? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. We okay. can. Hi. Yeah, I don't know whether you saw, I wasn't putting a question, I was making a comment about the situation where I am in South Africa. Um, and I was interested that Eleonora mentioned sustainability 
And it's something, I mean, everybody uses the word these days, mostly in connection with the environment and so forth. But in terms of archival collections, we are in a very, very dire and sad situation here where archival collections not only, I mean, you know, the issue of communities and, you know, who has control and access and all of this. And, you know, we have communities who are becoming more involved in trying to collect material within themselves and so forth and taking care of it or, or getting someone else to. But what's actually happening with major collections of national and international um, importance is that they are just shutting their doors. So most recently, the Mayabuya archive, which was based um, in at Robin Island um, and kind of managed to some extent by the University of the Western Cape, just like I think it was two weeks ago, to shut its doors. And the collection is no longer accessible. Now, all kinds of people um, donated their personal papers there, people who were involved in the, you know, the freedom struggle and so forth. It's an absolutely critical collection, photos, videos, papers, objects, T-shirts, flags. Um, and this week, a geological collection in the city of Johannesburg, which is uh, concerning the history and, you know, Johannesburg, big mining city and so forth situated within Museum Africa in Johannesburg, um, where there are also two critical photographic collections which are no longer accessible. Um, and so for us, we're, we're just in a completely different situation and, and um, even universities are seriously struggling. I work, I'm a freelancer, I work mainly in Wits University. Um, and we just, we're, we're just not getting funding. And even more critically, younger people, most archivists are female, white, and over 50 or over 55. Um, young people are just not coming into the profession. They're not interested, even if they know about it. The salaries are dreadful. Um, so, you know, sustainability for us is just, yeah, it's just absolutely critical. And, and obviously we're trying to involve communities and, and, and making it more accessible, leaving aside the whole COVID business. We're in a very bad stage with that at the moment. Um, so yeah, I just thought it would be useful just to comment really, rather than ask a question. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you for joining us and, and, and sharing that, that with us. Sounds like a yeah, very difficult situation that you've got there. I don't know if any of the panelists want to um, feel they have anything to respond to, to Ruth. I don't have anything to respond to. It's just that where I'm from, I'm from Uruguay in South America. And uh, it's not as tragic as what you are saying, but it's more or less, um, I think the economic background is probably similar. Uh, museums and, and, and universities in Europe have very little funding. Um, I know museums have very little funding and the museum are, and archival uh, profession in Uruguay is, is it existent, but it's very um, small and there's not really training. For example, there are no um, like museum studies um, careers in universities. So if you go to work in a museum, you you go, but you study somewhere, either somewhere else or something else. And the same with like archival studies. Um, so also like most of the people that work in in museums and archives tend to be older people. Um, so yeah, I sympathize with, um, with Ruth. Thank you, thank you, Cecilia. Um, we're just having a look through to see if we've got any more questions coming through. I think there were a few space specific questions which were for Cecilia and Sarah, but I think you've added a link in the chat to follow through um, on some of those. So I think that's... Um... Oh, here, yeah, there's a question about... Oh, this is... a. Question actually for Katie then, how did, how did the network advertise the project to the school students? And what was the selection process? Um, and did you already have links with the Arts Awards scheme? So maybe just a little bit more detail about your, your project with school students. 
Yeah, I, I should at this point admit to the fact that I, w I was more involved in the second project around teaching and learning and less in the Arts Award project. So I've put a link to the blog in the chat. We, as a, as a group, various members of the University Museums in Scotland group had worked with Arts Award projects before, but doing it at this scale together as a, as a network of university museums was, was a new development and a, and a kind of new way of working. But I don't know that I could give all the detail without risking getting it wrong. So I can connect anybody who's interested to the people who know that stuff. The blog has got some stuff as well. We were oversubscribed for people who wanted to participate, which means we're now looking at how to how to continue this model because it's clearly something that there's real demand for once you set it up in a way that that feels like participation is both kind of easy but also something people want to do. <laughs>